Hi everyone. I uh, hope everyone's doing well during this time of adversity and maybe you have a little bit extra time to be getting your fishing stuff ready for the year, which is always very helpful. I know I often run out at the end of the semester when things are getting crazy. So today I'm going to be presenting on fisheries induced evolution. So a couple of introdu introducing uh, talking points I want to discuss with you guys for this presentation is first, can recreational fishing induce evolution? <clears throat> and then secondly, if it does, uh, what are the main categories that it might induce evolution in? So I kind of separated it out into uh, behavioral. So how does fish behavior change as a result of exploited fisheries? Um, when I say exploited fisheries, there's many places that are being fished. Um, what are the physiological changes that can happen? So how does body function change as a result of fisheries induced evolution? And there's some interesting data I found on that. Um, and then thirdly, what are the morphological changes? So what are the uh, changes in things like uh, behavior, fitness, and reproduction? Um, how is that affecting fish growth? And uh, what size of fish we're catching and the rates that we catch them? So at this presentation, we're going to evaluate the implications of behavioral evolution from fishing. Uh, we're going to talk about the morphological effects of long-term fishing. Uh, so taking a look at a few studies, it has looked at fisheries that have been fished for a long time and what harvest practices uh, and how they affect an exploited fishery. So for example, how do minimum size limits affect an exploited fishery? Uh, we're going to try and assess physiological changes that affect individuals and populations from recreational angling. So as I mentioned, like how does body function change as a result of recreational fishing and angling? Um, and then of all of those effects, uh, hopefully we can talk about some mitigation. So when I say mitigation, basically just ways that um, we can address these effects occurring in our fisheries to promote the optimum experience for us as anglers and for conservation. And then finally, I'm just going to touch on really briefly toward the end of the presentation, just what changing social or legal needs uh, might need to be considered to manage fisheries in the future and how that might look differently than things have looked in the past. Um, first, to answer my first introduction question pretty briefly, um, Recreational fishing certainly uh, has evidence of inducing evolution in exploited fisheries. Um, so the first type of that evolution I'm going to talk about today is behavioral evolution. Um, so you think about fish behavior, uh, there's a few different parameters you can use to measure it, um, but one of the most common ones they use throughout all the research papers we're looking at uh, was vulnerability to angling. And so. Uh, vulnerable, vulnerability to angling is a heritable trait, which means it's um, passed down from generation to generation of fish. Um, and the Philip article from 2015 categorized fish into two categories, high vulnerability to angling and low vulnerability to angling. And so the high vulnerability to angling is usually described as HV. So if I ever refer to it as HV in this presentation, that's what I'm talking about. And then the low vulnerability is referred to as LV. The deal is that the high vulnerability fish is that they tend to be the most aggressive nest garters and foragers. So it makes sense that if a fish is very aggressive around their nest during spawn time, very aggressive foragers chasing down prey, they're also going to be the most susceptible to angling because they're going to be uh, similarly aggressive to fishing lures as they are in uh, for example, guarding their nests from bluegill, like in the example of a largemouth bass. Um, so therefore, they're also the most susceptible to angling efforts. And then low vulnerability fish or LV fish tend to be more timid. Um, and the problem is once you start fishing all these fisheries and catching all these high vulnerability fish and removing them from the system, uh, is that low vulnerability fish are the ones that remain and they comprise greater proportions 
uh, fish populations that are exploited to fishing. Um, and we'll describe that a little bit more in detail uh, on a couple slides. <clears throat> so how do we mitigate behavioral evolution in our fisheries? Um, I think that's a really, really good question. And it's a little bit of a complex answer. Um, so one of the studies I looked at, uh, I think it was the Cook article in 2017, um, was the use of aquatic protection areas as a proposal to mitigate behavioral evolution in fisheries. Um, so commonly referred to as APAs. And so basically what APAs are is their areas close to fishing in certain parts of a body of water. So I think in the study I was looking at, um, they had portions of a body of a body of water that were close off to fishing, like on the north and south sides of the lake, uh, but other parts were still exploited for fishing. <clears throat> And the results of that was um, that the presence of these APAs didn't affect a significant positive difference on boldness. Um, so boldness is that heritable trait, so that vulnerability to angling. Um, boldness is how willing a fish is to be aggressive toward things like fishing lures. Um, so think like aggressive foraging as, a, as an example of boldness. Um, but anyway, it didn't affect a significant positive difference on this boldness phenotype throughout the entire lake for uh, largemouth bass is what they were studying. <clears throat> so really the only, uh, only other realistic uh, significant proposition in this article was that protected and unexploited areas may preserve desirable phenotypes for anglers. Um, so an option to consider might be, do we need to uh, allow these lakes times to recover where they're protected, unexploited, close to fishing in order to optimize the fishing during other years? So you can even see kind of in this graph here, and I think my video recording is kind of blocking it up a little bit in the corner. Um, but ultimately the big thing I want you to take a look at in this graph on the right, um, it's just, the studies they did were broken up into outside of the aquatic protection area and then inside the aquatic protection area. Um, and so they kind of looked at the traits of the fish that, you know, existed inside these aquatic protection areas and outside and tried to compare them. Um, in reality, uh, the only big difference they found was that the capture method, so they used hoop nets. Um, and they use traditional angling. So the traditional angling is the black and then the gray is the hoop nets. The only big difference they found was that traditional angling tended to capture those more bold fish. Um, you can kind of see in this middle graph probably the best. Um, whereas a hoop net, which is more of like a passive capture method, tended to catch those more timid, low vulnerability fish. So it already in a way describes that um, fishing is already favoring the capture uh, and potential harvest of high vulnerability, more aggressive fish that have higher activity levels. <clears throat> Next, I took a look at the uh, physiological evolution. So what is happening at, you know, a cellular and body scale in these fish um, as a result of recreational fishing. And based on the Hessenauer article, which I found to be really good use for this, was uh, the average resting metabolic rates change as a result of fishing. So they tended to decrease due to recreational or exploited fishing compared to unexploited areas. And this was also for largemouth bass. Um, so if you take a look at this graph on the right, it kind of describes it pretty well. Um, the median is uh, reduced for exploited fisheries for Field RMR essentially means uh, field resting metabolic rates. Um, and so they tend to slow down that metabolic rate a little bit when uh, bodies of water are exposed to recreational fishing. Um, and as a result of that, foraging preferences start to change uh, after the selective harvest of the high vulnerability fish that have these higher metabolic rates. Um, they tend to target different types of prey because they're more aggressive. So as soon as those forage uh, preferences change after that selective harvest from the fishing, um, essentially the whole ecosystem can start to change because it's a stratified layer. 
um, that is affected by um, the activity of predators like largemouth bass. Thirdly, I took a look at morphological evolution, and this is a pretty important category, I think, especially with the implications that it has for uh, us as anglers, um, you know, kind of in addition to that behavioral component. Uh, but morphological evolution was, yeah, definitely an interesting talking point during my research for this presentation. So kind of a little case study that I had for this was the Sustaining Fisheries Yields Over Evolutionary Timescales article uh, from Conover 2002. So essentially what they did in that uh, research study was small fish were harvested in an experimental group and then large fish were harvested in another experimental group to kind of simulate what recreational fishing would do. And the result of that was that, uh, this is a little bit complicated maybe, but the biomass of fourth generation progeny harvested and mean weight of harvested individuals in small harvested lines were twice that of individuals in large harvested lines. So if they had a tank of fish with big bluegills like this one on top, um, and they harvested all those big bluegills and left small ones. Um, that was the tank that eventually in the fourth generation progeny um, had a mere half the half the biomass in it as the other tank did. <clears throat> and so it's kind of points to, you know, a pretty common theme when you discuss fisheries induced evolution is what is keeping large fish and harvesting them from populations doing to the fishery as a whole? And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more and hopefully explain it pretty well. Um, so ultimately the, the finding of that article was that the size of age tends to decline over time as a result of fishing. Uh, it definitely has implications for us as anglers, uh, people that probably wanna catch some big fish, I'm sure. How do we mitigate that? How do we mitigate uh, morphological evolution? Again, there's not really a simple answer to mitigating any of these fisheries-induced evolution uh, categories, but considering something like a change in harvest regulation, so there's a lot of minimum limits out there right now, especially fish throughout the Midwest. Um, but even looking at the opportunity to institute a maximum limit, uh, for certain species that are at greater risk of this evolution, um, and maybe for bodies of water that are at greater risk. So what does institute, uh, instituting the maximum limit really do? Well, it allows those bigger fish uh, that are reproducing to go back into the ecosystem and continue uh, promoting their traits for the future generations. Whereas if you just keep those large fish, um, you're really cutting down on the amount of traits that are getting passed forward for things like high growth rate, things that are going to preserve that uh, size at age variable I mentioned in the last slide. Another thing would be catch and release. Um, so greater adoption among anglers um, are starting to potentially regulate catch and release a little bit. Um, it was interesting, <clears throat> my paper summary uh, last week was on like a musculinge population and uh, the effect of catch and release on the size and um, behavior of these muscle in uh, northern Wisconsin over several years. <clears throat> and certainly it was interesting to see how the traits are passed along uh, a little bit easier when catch and release is widely practiced. Um, so yeah, and in addition to catch and release, I think it's important to say that you might need to supplement the stocking of fish that have, have high fitness have desirable phenotypes like that boldness phenotype uh, to kind of reestablish fisheries. So we can always institute catch and release um, currently, but that's not going to necessarily affect the genetics that already exist um, in that lake. And so promoting fish that have high fitness and desirable phenotypes through a stocking process can be pretty helpful. <clears throat> And I think the last piece here, I think for a little bit, um, is a change in fitness. I kind of touched on it a little bit in the last last slide too, but as I mentioned earlier, high vulnerability fish are the most aggressive nest garters 
and also the most likely to strike fishing lures, which means that high vulnerability fish are more likely to be harvested from fishing populations, which means that we're more or less favoring the reproduction of low vulnerability oriented fish um, through the harvest process. And LV fish reduce overall fitness and reproduction for several reasons. I kind of mentioned earlier, they're a little bit timid. Um, so they provide less active parental care than HV fish. And it's actually interesting, uh, wild type females also prefer spawning with uh, HV males. Now it's for uh, largemouth bass. Um, and they'll actually release more eggs if they're mating with a HV male compared to an LV male. So this graph on the right essentially to um, kind of describe this a little bit more. And again, my video is kind of just blocking a little part of it here. Um, but yeah, essentially uh, what that graph described was just the susceptibility to angling compared to um, LV fish and HV fish uh, for that study. To kind of just culminate all of these ideas and hopefully describe them in just a little bit more of a practical uh, way than a theoretical way, kind of tried to put together this little activity, so we'll just see how this goes on the slide. Um, should have some increase play happening. So basically, if you just consider it like this, um, you have a body of water, and on that body of water, there's a minimum size limit of 14 inches. And in that body of water, you have um, large fish, so these big green fish, maybe, um, kind of draws here, and then you have these small fish on the right side. And I decide that I want to go fishing out there. I'm going to pull my boat out there. And I'm going to cast my pole. And I'm going to start catching some big fish. Because that's what always happens right away in the beginning of the day. Um, so I put my lure out there and start catching these big fish. They're above the 14-inch minimum size limit. So I'm going to keep them. I'm going to have them for supper. Um, and then I start fishing somewhere else after I get those in the cooler. And I started catching these smaller fish. I'm like, what's going on? I caught a lot of big fish earlier, right? Um, so when I catch these smaller fish, they're not above the minimum size limit. And so I have to release them. So I'm releasing all the smaller fish into the system, but keeping the larger fish. So what happens as a result of that? Uh, the smaller fish that also tend to be the more timid fish that are less susceptible to angling. Uh, with low growth rates and poor fitness make up a greater proportion of the population, uh, which results in pretty large scale negative effects. So I kind of drew it out again here on the bottom, but if you're favoring that reproduction of those smaller, the smaller fish, especially if that's a uh, trait of low growth rate or something like that, um, then they're going to comprise the majority of the population, which essentially creates an undesirable fishery. And kind of lastly, before we conclude here, is uh, what, what do we need to consider from a social or legal change standpoint? Um, and it's not, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things that we consider in this category for sure. Um, if you just flip through any fishing regulations manual, that's a lot of social um, and moralistic regulation. Uh, but from our perspective, as students that are in science of angling, what ought we to consider from a social and legal change perspective to really mitigate these uh, fisheries induced evolution effects, um, especially if, if it is actually favoring those weak future generations of fish. Um, so for example, if we ever wanna take our kids out fishing someday, how can we make sure that they're also catching uh, big quality fish? Um, essentially there is, uh, one quote I have here from, uh, it was from Conover and Munch, and I thought it would just drove things home and I talked about it a little bit already, uh, but the proposal to introduce a maximum size limit. And so Conover and Munch said, uh, reliance on minimum size restriction as a basis for management needs rethinking. Where feasible, maximum size limits may offer some important advantages, such as promoting fast growing genotypes, stratified age structure, and ecosystem services. So there's a multitude, a plethora of benefits that could happen as a result of maximum size limits. Um, might be a little bit harder to 
to put into practice than it sounds perhaps. Um, but understanding these things from an angling perspective can also be helpful. So I just inserted this small cartoon. Um, we always have our minimum size limits, so throwing fish back to grow. Uh, but maybe in the future, something we might also have is really seeing, yeah, even those big fish um, to go back and reproduce and ensure future generations of strong fish. So in conclusion, fishing does induce uh, behavioral, physiological, and morphological evolution of individual fish and populations, uh, which affects several different functions of the fisheries as a whole and also the individual fish. There's also changes in fitness that occur. So uh, those fish that are continuing to reproduce are favoring a low vulnerability LV oriented fish population. And that's particular particularly pertinent for anglers like us that are searching for success, people that want to catch fish, especially people that want to catch large fish. Um, and lastly, yeah, I kind of offered to you guys some social or legal changes that might be considered to help mitigate these negative effects of traditional recreational fishing ethics. Um, so I encourage you guys to yeah, just contemplate those things. Um, then hopefully you all enjoyed doing the activity this week. Um, Kahoot's always a fun time. So certainly uh, thank you for going through this presentation with me and then all of my work cited around this page. If there's ever somewhere in my slides that has like a little number next to, next to some information, it's pointing toward my work cited page. So uh, there's like a little seven next to, the, next to the image, for example, it's pointing toward that image URL. If you want to go and access any of those resources for further reading. Thank you.